known territory or what's explored, unknown territory or what's not explored, the trans transformation or the dissolution of one into the other and then the reconstitution of that, that's what an election does, right? It's like, okay, we have our leader who's the person at the top of the dominance hierarchy and defines the nature of this particular structure, there's an election it's regulated chaos, no one knows what's going to happen, it's the death of the old king bang, we go into a chaotic state, everyone argues for a while and then out of that argument they produce a consensus and poof, we're in a new state right, that's the meta story, right, order, chaos, order, but it's partial order chaos, reconstituted and revivified order that's the thing, is that this order is better than that order so there's progress and that's partly why I think the idea of moral relativism is wrong there's progress in moral order and, and it was defined properly by Piaget the new moral order does everything the, other moral, the old moral order did and some additional things that's what constitutes progress now, here's a, here's a strange idea and we'll talk about this more as we progress through the class what's the ultimate in order? well, it's not this, obviously because it can collapse and it's not this because it can collapse and so then you think, well, there's no ultimate order even though there's progression but then you have to move it up one level of abstraction what's the ultimate order? doing this willingness to do that that's the ultimate order Right? It's order at a different level of analysis, and you can see that's what's represented in that idea. That's what that idea means. That's the phoenix, right? The phoenix is something that lives, ages, and then allows itself to be consumed by fire, and then re-emerges. And the old phoenix gets old and burns, and the new phoenix re-emerges. And so the real phoenix is the thing that's constant across those transformations. That's the union self. That's what he meant. The self is the element of the psyche that remains intact across transformations. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bloody amazing idea. That's for sure. And you could think about that. That's why Jung claimed, for example, in Ion, primarily, that Christ was a symbol of the self. That was his consequence of decades of meditation on the structure of Christianity because it's the dying and resurrecting part of the psyche that remains constant across the, the transformation so the ultimate order isn't to identify with this that's your current state of being and it isn't to identify with that because, well, you can't, by definition and it isn't even to identify with that it's to let these things go as they need to go, that's a sacrifice and to allow this continual process of transformation to occur and part of that is the admission that you're wrong and so partly what you're doing is at micro levels and at macro levels where are you not what you could be? and when you realize that it'll take you apart a little bit and burn you down to your core a little bit and then allow you to regenerate and if you do that continually then everything that you don't need burns away right and that's what this means you remember in Harry Potter, you may remember that Harry goes down, so in the second volume and in the second movie Harry's at Hogwarts, so it's the school where you learn how to be magic because that's what you really are and there's something that threatens the school, well part of what threatens the school? evil, right? Voldemort, that's one thing but at the same time it's also the snake that lurks underneath, it's the basilisk that that threatens the school, and so the basilisk is the dragon, and when the basilisk looks at you, then you're paralyzed, because you're a prey animal, and if a predator captures you in its gaze, you freeze, and the reason you freeze is because your body reacts to the predator as something that should turn you to stone sorry about that so what do you do about the basilisk? well, one thing you do is you run and hide but the other thing you do is go confront it in its lair, and that's what Harry Potter does now, and what's interesting about him is he's also touched by evil, right? and that means that he's an embodiment of what Jung would regard as someone who's integrated the shadow and without that capacity he isn't able to communicate, say, with snakes 
And that's not so good because since there are snakes, it's not such a bad idea to know how to communicate with them. And he goes down into the underground, right, into the chaotic domain that's underneath the school in order to find the snake in its lair. Now, if I remember correctly, you, can, you tell me if I'm wrong. Doesn't he go down through a bathroom? Through a toilet? Right. Well, so that's an indication of the Jungian dictum that where you, what you most, huh, what you need most is to be found where you least want to look. I had a client once who actually had a dream like that. He dreamt that he had to go into the underground world through an outhouse. Right, it was very, very interesting. And, and it was an, an elaboration of precisely this theme. It's what you've thrown away as of little value to you, and maybe what you hate and hold in contempt and fear, is exactly what you have to face if you want to go down to the place where the transformations occur. So what happens in Harry Potter? Well, this basilisk is, is wandering around, paralyzing everyone who isn't able to communicate with snakes. And he doesn't fight the basilisk precisely. He goes down into its lairs, the underground world. And that, what, what down there is that snake has got uh, Ginevra, right? His girlfriend, that's her name, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a variant of Virginia. That's a variant of virgin. And the snake always has a virgin. That's one of its characteristics, right? Like gold. He goes down there to rescue her. What happens to him? He gets bit, and he's going to die. So what happens? The phoenix comes along and cries tears into his wounds and cures him. And that's... <laughs> so the idea is that what saves you in the encounter with the snake is your capacity to let things go and die and come back to life. Right. It's so interesting, eh, that that, that story is told in that way in that series of volumes because the, 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 the plot structure is perfect in a mythological sense. It's exactly right. And the phoenix ap actually happens to be the pet of the main wizard, which is also perfect. It's exactly right. So, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, who, who? Dumbledore. Yeah, he's basically, for all intents and purposes, God the Father. And his pet, his, his, his close ally, is the thing that can die and that transforms. Well, you can see the echoes of Christian thought in that, but that isn't exactly right. It's the Christian thought and the mythological substructure upon which the Harry Potter volume is based are drawing from the same underlying pool of ideas and symbols. And they're universally accessible. And you can tell that because if they weren't, that book wouldn't have sold. How many million copies? How many million copies did it sell? And the movies. It's unbelievably, overwhelmingly powerful. She got kids to read 600-page books, like multiple volumes lining up for them. You've got to ask yourself, why? Silly stories about magical orphans. It's like, well, maybe not. Maybe people aren't so stupid. And certainly, if they happen to be reading relatively complex books, attributing that to stupidity seems to be rather counterproductive.